Welcome to the recorded version of the Grant Makers in Aging webinar, Fostering Dementia-Friendly Communities, from October 6, 2016. This Conversations with GIA event features John Feather of Grant Makers in Aging, Michael Buckley of the Bright Focus Foundation, Lily Fisher of the Montgomery County Government Health and Human Services Department, Olivia Mastery of the Coalition Action Lab and Dementia-Friendly America, and George Vredenberg of the U.S. Against Alzheimer's. This event was made possible by a partnership with the John A. Hartford Foundation and AARP Foundation. An interesting phenomena is emerging in our country in that communities are organizing locally and across community sectors to foster what is being referred to as dementia-friendly communities. While focused on dementia specifically, the effort is resulting in communities that are stronger and feel more equipped to address community health issues generally. We're very pleased to have three experts today to uh, help us understand and walk through your questions of, around these issues. Olivia Mastry is the founding partner of Collective Action and Lab and the executive lead of the Dementia Friendly America. Michael Buckley is vice president uh, for public affairs at the Bright Focus Foundation. And Lily Fisher is the Area Agency on Aging Coordinator for Montgomery County, Maryland's uh, Government Health and Human Services Division. We want to welcome you all. Olivia, let's start with you. Uh, could you please explain the value of fostering dementia-friendly communities throughout the country and the resources and tools that can help communities working towards dementia-friendliness? Sure. Thank you, John, and thanks for having me. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, the best place to really start this conversation around dementia-friendly communities is to look at the context and the demographic trends we're seeing across our country, because that really was the impetus for the development of the Dementia-Friendly America initiative. So what we're seeing right now is a rapid increase in the number of people living with dementia. We have over 5 million people in the U.S. today living with dementia. We know that number will grow into uh, more than 7 million just between now and 2025, so a 40% increase. And what we're seeing in the individuals who are living with dementia is more than half, about 60% of them, throughout the disease process continue to live in their community homes with the support of family and friends. As a result of that, we began to notice the impacts that community can have on people's success in living in community with dementia, and alternatively, the impact that people living with dementia and their care partners might have on different sectors of community. And it really was a mutual relationship that we thought needed attention. We know that 85% of all the care that people living in community with dementia receive are provided by family and friend caregivers on an unpaid basis. So we know that there's also a tremendous volunteer network out out there in the field, on the ground, that are an important part of this equation is that they too may need support from their communities in this important job. And we know that those caregivers are also employees in current businesses. And we're seeing in the business setting uh, enormous financial implications as workers in their caregiving role are needing to cut back or stop working altogether, and that's having an impact that's been valued of about $34 billion annually on employers. And then we also know that this just has a general cost to society in terms of the care and support needs of people living with dementia and the cost that that has for all of us. In this broader context, we began looking at recognizing that community continues to be an important forum for people living with dementia. What does community need to look like to support those individuals, to support their caregivers, to support the businesses that are operating in those communities, and to strengthen community while those supports are being provided? And that really was the starting point for Dementia-Friendly communi uh, Communities and the Amer uh, Dementia-Friendly America Initiative. If we could go to the next slide. Thank you. So the goal of the initiative is to foster dementia-friendly communities across the U.S. And what that means has really been an emerging topic because it's a fairly new concept. We had models to go from in the U.K. and Japan, but we really were starting this as a new conversation within the U.S. We could go to the next slide. 
we started this thought process first by looking at the World Health Organization's criteria for what did age-friendly mean, because we recognize that while dementia is not a normal condition of aging, age is the greatest risk factor for dementia, so we knew that an age major building block for a dementia-friendly community. In the World Health Organization, they break down community into domains and they identify what are age-friendly characteristics of each domain. So we really took a similar approach and built on top of the age-friendly domains, what is the dementia element that needs to be added? And some people ask why this focus on cognition, and it's really not dif that different from the decades we've spent in our country ensuring that people who have physical disabilities still have physical access to meaningful community engagement. We do that through curb cuts, through automatic doors, through wheelchair ramps. We have a similar issue facing us now that we're seeing this increase in cognitive decline as people are experiencing dementia causing diseases. And we need to find what are those curb cut analogies or automatic door analogies so that people still have cognitive access to community as well as physical. And so we really broke down community, as the World Health Organization did, into different sectors or domains, recognizing that every part of community has something it can do to be more dementia friendly. There's impetus and incentive to do this. For example, if you're a business, you may have long lasting customers who may be aging and losing cognition. And if you think that they might not be important, they're adult children who are accompanying them into the bank, into the dentist, into the grocery store, also have an interest in how that experience feels and goes. So there's actually a business incentive in thinking about what's the customer need as the customer demographic is changing and emerging. So based on this um, dementia-friendly sector approach, we tried to identify what are the dementia-friendly characteristics that each sector might want to have and how can they get there. Next slide. Um, as we began this work, we knew that this would be best organized if it was a national initiative, yet had statewide and local reach. And so we put together a national council that oversees and shapes the initiative. The foundational work grew out of one state pilot uh, operation in Minnesota, and it was an initiative called Act on Alzheimer's. But we, wrote, we brought it to the national level and really asked organizations that were reflective of all sectors of community to come to the table and help shape this collaboration that would help foster dementia-friendly communities across the U.S. And you can see by the logos reflected on the slide here that we really have very diverse organizations coming together and thinking together, from consumer organizations to legal and financial organizations to pharmacy to clinical to law enforcement. Uh, really a, a tremendous mix of organizations that are reflective of the broader community, helping to shape where this might go. Next slide. As we thought about the best way to organize uh, resources and support for local communities, we knew we had this national council of organizations shaping the effort, and all of them had reach into statewide and local membership, affiliates, and franchises. And we wanted to make sure that we could offer up to local community, as these organizations and individuals were organizing at the local level, all the tools and resources they might need if they wanted to work locally to work to become dementia friendly. So we created a web portal that holds the tools and resources, and we spent about two years in the Minnesota model developing those tools and resources by looking across everything available in the world and identifying what are the best examples and the best policies and practices that can foster dementia friendliness in each and every sector of community. So that web portal sits on a website called DFA America, so dfamerica.org. And that is a way that an entity, an individual, an organization can tap into the materials that are available to them at the local community. And it's really there to be a self-directed guide, although we do offer technical assistance to support communities in this effort. Everything on the web portal is free. It's downloadable. It can be co-branded or branded at a local level to create local identity. It is really there to foster the development of dementia-friendly communities. Next slide. Just give you a little bit of information about the nature of the resources that are available to local communities, and then I'll talk a little bit about the process that communities might go through to pursue this work. 
So on the website, we have sector-specific guide for every part of community. And in each guide, there is guidance on why it's important to be dementia-friendly in that particular sector, what's the incentive to do something, what it is that that particular sector might want to learn to become dementia-friendly, what are the best policies and practices they might want to adopt, and then we link them directly to those policies and practices so that they can implement them should they be so inclined. So you can see from the screen the variety of sector guides or guidance that we provide to different parts of community so that each part of community can know what to do and how to do it. Next step, uh, next slide. In addition to providing communities with information on what each sector can do, we also know the power especially from our Minnesota model, of seeing community come together and work through the process in a collaborative cross-sector way. And so in that regard, we did um, a lot of research on what really results in long-lasting cross-sector community change. And based on that research, we put together a four-phase community toolkit process. And so this is a process that really guides communities around convening the right people to the table so that they know who to convene, what do you talk about first, second, and third to move this process forward, what kind of championship do you need at the table, what kind of track record do you need, what sort of resources, funding, and partners would you want. We also walk them through how to engage the broader community once you do pull together a core team to do this work so that this is a large-scale community conversation and change effort, not just a small group of actors trying to make change. Thirdly, we talk about how we guide a, a community through the process of asking the broader community where are our strengths in terms of dementia friendliness as we sit here today, where are their gaps, and what might we do to close those gaps. And then lastly, the fourth phase is to identify community change goals and to work together to make those goals real. If we go to the next slide. The power of this work really comes from this cross-sector combination or collaboration of people and organizations coming together around this work. And so what we've seen in the communities doing this work, Minnesota has about 43 communities in rural, urban, suburban, and communities of interest already at work. And I'll talk a little bit about what's happening nationally with other communities in just a minute. But at the core of all this work is this concept of the action team. It is ideally, and we would say always populated and guided or shaped by the voice of people living with dementia and their family caregivers, but it is also reflective and representative of the broader community. So on an action team, you would want to have, if possible, a touch point to every sector of community so you have a bridge to go out and talk about this, provide sector guidance, get information from the broader community, and bring that back. Next slide. The action team is really what makes this a community-driven process, a community enrichment process, because while everyone's working together on dementia, in the process of doing that, they're also strengthening their own community ties for purposes of future community health goals that they might want to achieve together. This process has emerged and evolved over time, and as I mentioned, Minnesota was the starting point for the process, but in July of 2015, as part of the White House Conference on Aging, we invited an additional number of communities to serve as early adopter communities to model this work in 2015 and 2016, and that's really what has been going on in the past um, 18 months. Uh, a couple of the communities um, had been doing some work but hadn't been organizing in this way, and for other communities, it was a brand new conversation. You can see from this slide that we had cities join us, county-level communities, and even state champion communities. Next slide. So we're just a little more than a year out from the White House Conference on Aging, and you can see by this map that there's been enormous appetite and change movement around this effort. The states you see in orange on this map are states who have come in, in addition to the blue states, into the Dementia Friendly America Network and are actively working to become dementia friendly. So we have communities in 30 states working to become dementia friendly. Ten of those states are championing the effort at the state level and other states it's either a county or city level. We may have multiple cities and counties in any one state. The purple states are states where there have been communities that are inquiring and preparing but haven't yet begun the work process to become dementia friendly. Next slide. 
With all of this momentum, we try to give technical assistance to the communities that come in through a very small team at the collaborative level, but most of the resources and tools are available on the website, bfamerica.org, and we offer monthly webinars for information about that. So we really have tried to put together a self-directed, do-it-yourself process to work at a community level to become dementia-friendly. This all sounds great, but the best way to really learn about how this plays out and what this feels like on the inside is to get that on-the-ground case study of how a community works to become dementia-friendly. We had a wonderful community join us very early on in this process. Montgomery County, Maryland um, had, uh, came on to the Dementia Friendly America Network, and within their team, they had um, one of the, the champions or leaders within the team was Bright Focus Foundation. We felt that this was a great case study to share because it really does reflect the role, first of all, of um, foundation uh, in, this, in this equation and the roles that they can play, but it's also a really great case study of how different parts of community have come together to move forward in this effort. Next slide. We have two individuals who are with us on the call to really present um, information about what this experience has been like. So Michael Buckley from the Bright Focus Foundation is with us, Vice President of Public Affairs of Bright Focus Foundation. And then we also have Lily Fisher, um, Montgomery County Government and Health and Human Services. She's the Area Agency on Aging Coordinator in that area, but also is serving as the community lead for the action team that I showed a picture of earlier in this process. So each of them are going to talk a little bit about what this experience has been like, why they organized, how they've organized, and what they're beginning to see. Go to the next slide so Michael can um, begin that conversation. Hey, Michael, before you start, uh, just a, a quick reminder to everyone that we will be having a question and answer period at the end of our session. You can go ahead and uh, start writing your questions in in the box. If you go to the, uh, the, the box that's on the right hand of your screen, you'll see a question a area. If you open that, you can uh, add your questions, and I'll be reading those to our uh, participants later. Michael, why don't you take it away? Uh, thank you, John. Uh, good afternoon. This is Michael Buckley. I'm the Vice President for Public Affairs at the Bright Focus Foundation. Bright Focus funds uh, scientific research worldwide to find cures and better treatments for Alzheimer's, macular degeneration, and glaucoma. Uh, right now we have about a, 150 research projects going on around the world uh, on these diseases, and we share the findings of this research through a number of materials that are all free, print and digital, uh, for families that are impacted by these diseases. Uh, and for more information on that, please visit us at brightfocus.org. And I want to briefly talk about uh, our experience with, with Dementia Friendly America, both um, as a foundation and uh, in, in the individual community. We first learned of Dementia Friendly America approximately three years ago, and uh, folks here were, were, were just thrilled. And at, a, at its most simple level, it just felt right. It just seemed like the right moral and ethical and policy direction for how, for how America should, uh, should proceed in this area. And we decided to get involved for, for several reasons. Uh, first, you know, we're primarily a research organization. We're funding uh, about $11 million a year in research to cure these diseases. And as much as you know, we, we have very high hopes for our research, the reality is scientific breakthroughs take time, and getting those into communities and into people's hands takes time. So, well, research is the, is the tomorrow. We, we wanted to be very cognizant and supportive of, of today, of families and communities that are impacted by these diseases. Uh, Bright Focus is funded uh, exclusively by private donations, um, nearly all of them uh, small, uh, small donors. So we wanted to be responsive to our constituency that was living this out every day. And we felt by getting involved with Dementia Friendly America, it would help reinforce the message that the challenge this nation is facing on Alzheimer's and related dementia is, is a very, very large challenge. And it's not something that one particular government agency or community group or foundation or, or any one uh, organization could solve on its own. We felt that Dementia Friendly America helped reinforce the message that we must be united behind this goal. And we, 
you know, the opportunity to get involved with Dementia Friendly America uh, coincided with our strategic decision at Bright Focus to become more involved with the larger uh, with the larger community of of uh, community groups and advocacy uh, advocacy leaders and other allies. So this so this was a nice extension of that. So talk, I'll talk briefly about our national our role of the National Dementia Campaign, and then turn to our role in Montgomery County, Maryland. Uh, on the national level, like I said, we'd, we'd just we'd begun to work more closely with a range of of uh, policy and, and research and, and advocacy partners, and, and a number of these groups were coming together in, around Dementia Friendly America. So it was a nice way to expand our work with groups that we were uh, beginning to work with and beginning to work well. And it's a very the it's a very enthusiastic and collaborative group. It's a group of people who share common ideas, who are very generous with their time, and and very good. At sharing some of their networking, um, uh, you know, ideas and contacts that might help. Um, so I had the opportunity to become the co-chair of the National Communications and Outreach Committee for for the campaign, and it's been a great opportunity to work uh, uh, nationally with with, with the, the growing number of, of of communities that have been a part of it. And then the other half of the involvement for Bright Focus is local. It's here in Montgomery County, Maryland, which uh, as Lily will. We'll describe in, in a little bit of detail in a moment. Montgomery County is just north of Washington, D.C. We are the, uh, the Maryland suburbs um, that start at the D.C. border, Bethesda and Rockville and, and Silver Spring, uh, to name just a few communities. And uh, Bright Focus is located in Montgomery County. We've been here in this county for, for over 40 years. But we, we came to the realization that it had only just been a coincidence that we were in Montgomery County um, uh, you know, we didn't have a, a involvement with with the community or or the local government, and and we felt it was very important for a foundation to not get isolated and to to instead be integrated in the um, in the community. Particularly, when we looked at the strengths of Montgomery County and the strengths of Bright Focus. Montgomery County, uh, as, as some of you may know, is home to the National Institutes of Health, as well as a number of of private sector efforts. In the health, in uh, in healthcare and science and technology, and so for Bright Focus, with you know, with our worldwide portfolio of research and and um, and, and materials to, to share with families, we were doing a lot of the same work, and and thought it was a great opportunity to to share the resources that we have with our community, and then lastly, from a a, a policy standpoint. For better or for worse, what happens in the Washington area gets noticed. Um, we're sort of living under a microscope here, so when our subway trains break down, the whole nation knows about it. And it can also have, they can also have a positive policy laboratory opportunity. So when something goes right, you know, our, our thinking was that when something goes right in the Washington area, it's going to get noticed. And we were just very enthusiastic and very very optimistic about dementia friendly America. So we felt like. Um, Start, starting it here in Montgomery County, in addition to our neighboring county of Prince George's County, Maryland, that that success here would resonate; it would get noticed more than in other uh, in um, other settings. So we're fortunate, as, as Olivia mentioned, to have um, some great uh, toolkits to help communities get started. And um, uh, Olivia, as well as um, Sandy Markwood at the National Association of Area Agencies on Aging, really helped. Um, Helped us get started with a lot of great community guides, and a particular one I want to mention is these these sector guides uh, that Olivia uh, cited a few minutes ago. To me, they put the meat on the bones. They're a way of saying to people in about six or seven or eight different sectors, "Here is what dementia friendly means to you know, banking, law enforcement, first responders, um, and others." Because when we start talking about this campaign, obviously nobody wants nobody is dementia unfriendly. So there was the obvious. So the first question was always, well, what does this mean? And those sector guides were, were incredibly helpful. So Bright Focus, as a private foundation, um, was able to to lend some resources that were uh, unique and hopefully complementary. Uh, as a, a little more flexibility as a private organization, we could um, facilitate meeting space, um, some some financial support, sort of an overall flexibility that might help an initiative. Get get off the ground a little, a little more smoothly, and we're able to to share a lot of our our networks and people that we know, and and again sometimes with a flexibility that is easier for a non-governmental entity to initiate um, some phone calls or outreach, 
And in our unique role as being uh, part of the National Steering Committee and also uh, active in the local efforts here in Montgomery County, we've been able to act in, as a liaison of, of updating both the county uh, act and the national on each other's activities, but also share updates and concerns and best, and best practices. So the last point I want to make about Montgomery County is just some observations um, on our success here. And again, Lily Fisher with the county will talk about this in just a moment. But I've just been tremendously impressed with the breadth and depth and enthusiasm of such a you know, diverse people from diverse uh, sectors of the government and, uh, and private organizations, healthcare, uh, other community leaders that have been that have united behind this. And they've been united behind the shared goal of improving quality of life for a, a large and, and, and unfortunately growing part of the population that, that is facing um, uh, cognitive impairment. And when we get together, uh, we really look at, at, at the quality of life and, and look at it in the sense of almost like what is a typical, what would a typical day be like in, in some of the community centers uh, in Montgomery County? It's like, you know, could someone take a bus? What would the experience be like if they took a bus to their, to their town center and wanted to go to the bank and wanted to get a cup of coffee and wanted to shop at a store and mail something to the post office and take the bus back. Like what would that experience be like with cognitive challenges and how can we make this better so people can can continue to live live in the community for much long for a longer period of time. And and lastly, what we found in the the year or two we've been been going on this about a year so year and a half in Montgomery County is there are great things that are happening. And so this is not creating new work. This is really bringing people together and making their existing work um, more coordinated, more unified. So it, it's really um, uh, working with the county leaders and, and Olivia and N4A. It's really been a process of, of steering and leading and uniting and not having to, you know, nudge or prod people to do more. So it's been an incredibly positive experience. And uh, without further ado, it's uh, turn it turned over to Lily Fisher, who could explain um, in, in uh, you know, some specifics that we've been able to accomplish. But I just want to wrap up. This has been one of the you know, best professional experiences I've ever had, both at the national and the county level. And it's, um, it's been a real honor to uh, help steer uh, Bright Focus Foundation uh, in, into this work. So thanks. Thanks, Michael. Could so you the uh, add the local example, Lily? Yeah, so um, I'm Lily Fisher, and my larger picture position is the facilitator of caregiver support with Montgomery County government. Um, as Michael said, that we are located in Maryland. We're about, just to situate it for people, we're about 23 miles where I'm sitting right now in Rockville from the US Capitol building. and our physical size is about the size of Guam, about 507 square miles. We have three cities, 12 towns, four villages, and five unincorporated communities. And our population is rising. And about, at the moment, it's at 1.4 million people. Um, our demographic is very diverse. We are known of having some of the most diverse communities in the country where English is oftentimes the second language spoken at home. We have um, uh, Lily, you still with us? I think we have a uh, technical glitch here. We'll try to get uh, Lily back with us in just a second. Um, uh, Olivia, are you still with us? Yes, I am. I think we'll move to uh, some questions, and uh, when Lily comes back, we'll be able to uh, talk about the specifics. We had a couple okay. questions about. Uh, hi, are you back, Lily? Okay. So uh, a couple questions about the the area in general. Uh, so I, a question that I know you get asked often, and you already touched on it, but I uh, had a couple of. Uh, items about was how does this relate to uh, the, the, the many other community development efforts that are going on, particularly around uh, making disability 
friendly communities making uh, and age friendly communities. So are these are these is your experience that these have been co you know conflicting efforts, competing efforts? Uh, do people get confused by them, and how have you addressed that? Sure. Um, they're actually all complementary efforts. I would say the two that most often go hand in hand are the age friendly and dementia friendly, although um, the, the, the disability access is very much a part of this. It's just very often people don't think about the cognitive disabilities. They only think about the physical. So you can always take this work and have it be complementary to what's already going on. Um, even on our website, we provide guidance to age-friendly um, communities that are working on age-friendly to show exactly side by side what are the just the add-ons that you would want to think about to make sure that as you're age friendly you're also being dementia friendly. So we've already created a resource that will help in that regard and some of our communities like Boston, Massachusetts for example and Tempe, Arizona have incorporated and integrated their age friendly and dementia friendly work into the same set of government offices and government plans and it looks like San Diego is going to be uh, doing something very similar to that in the next couple of months. So if you can see them as complementary, it's really starting with whatever the foundational focus was, disability or age, let's say, start there and then look at the materials that are on our website and say what are just the additional extra steps we would need to take because everything we're already doing is fostering dementia friendly, but there are a few things that will address the cognitive limitations that we might not otherwise think about. Um, so that's really the way we, we guide and coach groups and have tried to put um, as much resources on the website to guide in that as possible. Okay. Let me ask you one other question and then uh, I'll move on to uh, some other um, areas of interest. Uh, and that's the whole issue of uh, research and evaluation. Is there anything that shows that uh, dementia-friendly communities uh, work better in any, any uh, you know, measurable capacity. How are you looking at evaluation strategies for these issues? Sure. Um, so we have some traction on that in Minnesota, but let me take a worldwide uh, view first. So far, there haven't been what we would call research studies on the impact of dementia-friendly communities anywhere in the world. With that said, there have been a number of evaluation guidelines or um, model metrics a community might want to aim for as they work to become dementia friendly. And we have aggregated that and make it available to the communities that join on to the DFA effort and then work with them to try to gauge their progress. A lot of the progress we've measured to date, given the newness of this initiative, um, is in Minnesota and it's around what are the community changes we're seeing just as a result of this work that make community more navigable, for example, due to better signage, uh, due to different ways of laying out environments so that there is less contrasting floor and wall space, that there are wider aisles, that there are benches to rest. Some of these very basic, simple things have made a difference in terms of first organizations are adopting those changes and then secondly people who test it or move through it are experiencing a more positive navigable community as a result of the work. That's the environment. There's also the relational piece is if we train all of ourselves as neighbors, as cashiers, as uh, lawyers, as bankers to know what are the signs of impairment, what does this look like, whether the person has dementia or not, it's kind of irrelevant, just what are the signs that someone is cognitively in a challenging moment, um, what are helpful responses to that versus hurtful responses to that, and train people to know how to respond helpfully. So once you get, again, the first set of evaluation is process, have organizations adopted this training and these approaches, and then what's the effect that people using those services are experiencing. So that's in the level of evaluation to date. We don't yet have the longer term evaluative of is it easier to get services generally in a community? Have we improved the quality of life for all people living with dementia in a community? We're not there yet. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I, th I think Lily's back with us. Are you, Lily? Okay. We seem to continue to have uh, some issues. So, uh, 
Michael, let me ask you a question about uh, how your foundation got involved in this uh, issue in Montgomery County. And maybe uh, we're going to need to ask you to fill us in a little bit on the specifics of the program. So would you like to, to do a little bit of, around that? Uh, sure. Yeah. Yeah, no, um, yeah, I'd be glad to just to, to briefly talk about um, our first year of success in Montgomery County and, and uh, give, give much of the credit to, to Lily, who um, hopefully will be back with us shortly. What we've done is um, we've had meetings every other month uh, to, to develop steering committee and, and, um, and, and, and clear attainable goals uh, uh, relevant to, to Olivia's good point a minute ago about, about evaluation. And some specific uh, success stories are um, our first responders, our, our, our police department, our fire department, and uh, uh, ambulance um, uh, emergency response folks had all had, we're all doing some efforts to help people uh, with Alzheimer's, you know, when they respond to a situation at a house or an apartment complex involve, involving a family. But none of these efforts were coordinated. So now they they work together. They're putting together shared materials that go out on, on each um, each car or truck. Um, and, and as um, Lily started to mention, it's a very large county. It's um, uh, that, um, uh, you know, this is, I, so it's, you know, this is, this is a big deal. I believe Lily is back on the phone. So before I talk too much about it, her success. Yep. Lily, I, I'll I, let you talk about your success. Good. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. You deserve so, all the credit. So. Um, so as Michael just mentioned is that what this initiative has been able to do for Montgomery County is to coordinate um, already um, vested interests. So um, I, I came back in on the call where Michael was talking about our police, fire and rescue team. And that is an example of where um, government departments were already doing incredibly um, vigilant work to be able to support people on the grassroots level. But then um, this initiative brought them into the room for the first time, which is actually shocking. And they immediately saw the opportunity to both collaborate and enhance. But some of the pieces that we've found very meaningful is that they've seen how they can use this as a best practice model to not just work outwards but also to ensure that every officer within their workforce is trained. Every new recruit goes through a dementia training awareness program that is fully endorsed by their hierarchy. So then everyone is on the same page together. Um, another part that we're very excited about is the partnership with our community college and um, our state's attorney's office. Our community college is very unique because it develops uh, programs that are to train certified nursing assistants and also employment opportunity programs all within the same um, institution. Yet what we knew um, was that oftentimes those trainees aren't fully aware of their roles and responsibilities when they get out into the community. So through discussion, we were able to bring together the priorities of our state's attorney's office, which already were focused on educating the bar, educating the elder law section, also educating financial planners but then taking it back into the micro and say, who is going into the home? Who is actually providing support both to the caregiver and the person with the, di the dementia diagnosis? How can we as a community pull those resources so we're able to connect and elevate exactly what is um, the spirit of a dementia-friendly community? And one other area that I'd like to um, just um, dovetail back into um, is how um, we are working with our local hospitals. Um, our hospitals um, are all under an umbrella which is being really influenced by changes to um, Medicare, reimbursements, and also a greater acknowledgement of how community healthcare has to ensure that when someone comes through a hospital, 
it's not just what happens in the hospital that counts. It also has to be a very vigilant um, discharge planning, et cetera. So we're very fortunate to have um, a senior vice president in one of our five major hospitals who heads one of our um, work groups. And our work groups are exactly that, that anchor point between the action team that meets every second month and how do we implement um, this sort of work out in the community. So our heads of our work groups are on our action team and then they bring together 10 to 20 people who then are specialists in their specific field. Um, sometimes it may be they already have that, um, that degree of consulting within their communities, or it may be like with our continuum of healthcare communities, that they are actually bringing forward new people, new leaders, who are saying this is our opportunity to break down our isolation and start to work in collaboration with each other and finding how we can turn both our knowledge and our passion as professionals into coordinated activities. Well, thank you so much. That's a, that's a very inspiring story. Uh, and I think we've got uh, time for a few questions, but, but let me turn one of the questions right back to, to you, Lily, which is, um, in all of these efforts, and it's something that I already asked uh, Olivia to touch on a little bit, uh, there are, you know, there are autism-friendly efforts and Parkinson's efforts and uh, and as well as age-friendly community efforts and so forth. How have you been able to make sure that all, all the pieces of this fit together uh, in Montgomery County? That's a really great question because we we have also adopted the World Health Organization's age-friendly city. Um, initiative. And so how we're doing it is to constantly be looking at integration. So we are at early stages of becoming certified with age-friendly city. So immediately what we're doing is uh, creating an open structure where yes, age-friendly goes all the way through more of the institutional part of our organization. But we're actually looking at how can we have it that um, both our external partners and internal folk, their time isn't being overduplicated, And so that's an example across all of those other initiatives because we have many of them in the county and we want to make sure that the folk who commit to our um, work groups and our action teams stay excited about what they're doing and um, keep on wanting to, to see that there is an outcome. So it's, it's, it's a delicate balance, but it's one that we're doing a pretty good job of. Well, uh, I'll stick with you for one more minute again, uh, because we have a question about you, a question to you specifically, which is, uh, do you have an estimate of how much time, uh, in terms of percentage, that, that you spend on this effort, or maybe the coordination uh, effort that goes with this? Sure. Um, I'm going to answer that in two ways that firstly, because this is a public-private partnership, all of the work that I do commit to it then has an incredible trickle-on effect with everything else I do because it's constantly about networking, bringing together and forming partnerships across the county. So practically, um, we meet every um, second month so that um, that takes about three hours all up. Um, there's a little bit of bureaucracy front and back of the meetings, so you know another hour here and there. Normally what I do is spend some time with those work groups when they're getting started, so you know a couple of hours here and there, but I then hand over the baton to the facilitators of each work group and they then report back to their peers in the action team. So all up, I would say on a monthly basis, it really discreetly just on Dementia Friendly America, it probably works out between you know maybe 10 and 15 hours that um, I would commit to this initiative. Okay, that's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, 
Michael, let's come back to you for a moment and talk about uh, what advice you might have for uh, foundations that are interested in this work. How, how could they get involved, uh, if particularly for the smaller or uh, locally based foundations? Do you see a, a role for them? Yeah. No. Uh, yeah. Exactly. Uh, thanks, John. I think uh, t I, two kind of two answers to that question. One. In terms of the decision of considering whether to be involved with Dementia Friendly America, I would encourage a foundation, regardless of its size, to think more broadly about the question of dementia and and in in the, in the sense of how it affects the broader community. As for example, as Lily mentioned, um, the financial sector and our local state's attorney are are seeing how dementia impacts. Uh, an aging uh, customer base at banks and, and someone with cognitive impairment and some of the financial and legal and family issues there. So I use that as an example of not be someone's first reaction when they think about Alzheimer's and, and dementia is, you know, the local bank or some of the, you know, the legal and financial issues. So, so I'd encourage people to, to see a connection with your foundation by, by thinking about this very broadly. And then secondly, to your question, John, about um, uh, uh, Money and perhaps you know not being able to make a larger uh, investment. Um, certainly, the certainly uh, like any campaign, um, uh, funding makes makes more things possible. But an equal part of what's making dementia friendly successful, both in Montgomery County, Maryland, and in uh, what's becoming a majority of the states in this country, is the is the the cooperation and the partnership and and sharing your. Um, your networks and trying to connect people. So there, there's a lot of a lot of um, uh, coalition building and uniting uh, that does not involve uh, direct financial support. Well, it, let me do a, a follow-up question that someone asked, which is, um, in the particular circumstance that, that you're talking about in Montgomery County, what what kinds of things was the money actually used for? Uh, is it sure. for the planning process or specific uh, activities or or whatever? Yeah, no, good. Uh, it it it's been um, in a nice way, relatively uh, small but leveraged situation. You know, we we um, we hosted the first kickoff meeting, so we we you know shared our our conference facility and and printing costs and 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 you know some meals there. There's been a few situations where um, you know maybe there'd be uh, some outside resources to you know temporarily hire someone for a project. So it's it's almost more at the county level stepping in. Uh, it, with the flexibility or the nimbleness that a private, that a non-governmental organization can have. At the national level, uh, we have been more of a direct financial supporter of the campaign, in addition to lending uh, staff time to, to serve on committees. Uh, Olivia, let's, let's come back to you and, and talk a little bit more about the, the role that foundations and other <coughs> funders are playing at the national level. Um, what, what do you see as, as some useful strategies, uh, particularly in terms of uh, foundation support for this program uh, in, in the more modest uh, price range, I guess? So if we were talking about something that was a, a you know, $50,000 uh, grant to you, is that sufficient to start a, a local program, or how, how, does, how does that kind of uh, funding work uh, with this? Yeah, uh, so I'll talk about the Minnesota experience and then I'll compare that to how it's unfolding nationally. But in Minnesota, we, we actually had an opportunity through a large philanthropic grant to seed local communities. So when I'm answering your question, John, I'm thinking about maybe a, com a, a local foundation that wants to invest in one particular geographic community. Um, and, and so when we seeded a local community like that, we actually provided many grants of $18,000. So five to 8,000 was used towards coordinating and planning around the, the work and going through that community toolkit process. And then the, sec the, the remaining 10,000 was available to a community to actually implement community change goals. So as a result of that, we saw new respite programs come forward, or memory cafes, or specialized arts programs, or um, payment for clinical or law enforcement trainings. And so those were the types of things that dollars got spent on. But the entire effort tended to be a mix of that seed dollar plus um, multiple little types of in-kind support. So an, a community, a local community seeing something in the amount of $50,000 would feel quite 
affluent in, in compared to some of what other communities have been able to get. Because we're not talking usually about starting something new and funding it forever. It's really about recognizing what's already there, the assets within the community, connecting the dots and making it a functioning system that allows better access for people living with dementia. So that was the Minnesota experience. At a national level, we did not have the ability to do the seed funding, so instead we offer technical assistance to local communities to help them find local funders. Um, and again, they have had varying levels of experience and success, but I would say at the most part, um, a seed grant of in the $20,000 to $30,000 range has been ample dollars to really get this going. And then as it goes along, if the change goals have bigger price tags, there is usually a local funder that really has an interest in a particular change goal that could maybe add in along the way. So this is a pretty modest um, financial investment effort. What's, as Michael said, what's equally important is the brain power at the table and leveraging um, connections and helping to connect the dots based on community relationships. So a dual role that foundations can play. Okay. Uh, in terms of uh, as we as we come to the end of our uh, time for questions, uh, in terms of where you see this going in the next three or four years. Uh, is it expansion around uh, the same sorts of efforts, or is there going to be some different uh, programmatic goals as well? I think we'll get more sophisticated programmatic goals as this evolves. And so in these early years, it's a lot of process convening, connecting dots, creating plans, and having kind of those early um, wins. Any change process always starts with that awareness, education, equipping the broader community. Then over time, and Minnesota has really taught us this, we'll start to see much deeper programmatic changes. So for example, a year ago in Minnesota, we were introducing what optimal care in the dementia arena looks like for health systems. And about a year and a half later, we now actually have health systems that have implemented optimal dementia practices in their care systems and even put them into their electronic medical record. So as we move further along, we'll be able to get deeper investments in what dementia friendliness looks like and is in every sector of community. Um, we expect to see more communities doing it and those who have been doing it a while getting deeper and, and more effective in what it means to be dementia friendly. That's why we call it working to become dementia friendly rather than you've landed, you're done, go do something else. It's an ongoing process. Indeed, and I, I think that's the, the story and uh, result that we also see with all the other movements, particularly in the age-friendly communities thing. You don't get to be an age-friendly community and then you check that off the list. Uh, it's an ongoing process. Uh, right. When, when Mayor Bloomberg created uh, the, the process in New York City, they created a 50-year plan, 5-0. Um, like you said, if we don't start today in 50 years, we won't have an age-friendly community. So I would like now to turn to our speakers uh, one last time to ask them for their final comments uh, as, as we wrap up the session. And uh, Lily, why don't we start with you? I think the piece that I am seeing as this develops, and particularly our relationship with Bright Focus Foundation, is that Bright Focus in, in partnership with the county is really able to bring a different perspective into this work. Um, obviously as a research institute they, are, they um, have that point of view but also out into the broader community that for this to have impact in Montgomery County we need to have all level of decision makers getting on board and that's one of the things that I rely very heavily um, with Bright Focus to really help those relationships to get groomed. Great, thank you so much. Uh, Michael, how about you? Final words for our audience? Uh, yes, yeah, um, thank you. I would uh, encourage foundations and uh, people in a number of sectors to look at dementia very broadly, to not see it as just a, you know, a disease or a medical condition, and instead think about what it is, its, its impact on our, on our communities and our nation. 10,000 Americans turn 65. Uh, every day. Montgomery County, Maryland is on pace to have more senior citizens than public school uh, students. So, so as, all, as everyone in this call knows, things are changing and so dementia, uh, get, as it is an age-related disease, it's gonna ha is increasingly having broad implications you know, for employers, for 
uh, legal and financial institutions and and, and a range of, of, of settings. So uh, if at first blush you might not think this is a good match for uh, for your purview, I, I'd encourage you to, to, to give it a second look and, and think about uh, you know, the, the, both the, the consequences of the aging population, but really also the, you know, the, the opportunities, as Olivia mentioned, with uh, disability access, how there, it, 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 there's a positive societal change um, that that you know that that happened there, and I think dementia friendly America um, is on its way to really improving the quality of life um, all across the country. Thanks so much, uh, Olivia. Uh, you you have the final word. Sure, I just want to speak to those who this might resonate with. If you're thinking about the what now or how might one get involved in this work at the local community level, um, we have a small technical assistance team. So if you go on the website, dfamerica.org, you'll see an email address there. Uh, reach out to us and we can actually tell you if there's already a community emerging where you are and connect the dots with uh, their lead. And if there isn't one, we can also um, have a call with you to coach through what does it look like to start one and whether you might have an interest in championing the effort, whether it's through just um, bringing the right people together or through backing it financially. Uh, it can be an either or or both and. So we are happy to connect the dots to help to the next step and hope that those of you on the phone whom this does resonate with would reach out to us so that we can help connect those dots and continue to foster dementia-friendly communities across the country. I want to thank Olivia Mastry, the founding partner of Collective Action Lab and the executive lead for Dementia Friendly America. Michael Buckley, the vice president for public affairs at the Bright Focus Foundation and Lily Fisher, the Area Agency on Aging Coordinator for Montgomery County, Maryland, uh, in the Health and Human Services Department for their participation in today's program. We thank all of you for what you do to make life better for older people. I also want to thank the John A. Hartford Foundation for their continuing support of this program and the AERP Foundation, who is co-sponsoring today's uh, webinar. We will be making this presentation available to anyone who wishes to view it later, including both the slides and the audio. Watch for a rebroadcast link, which will be on our website at www.giaging.org, or contact us at info at giaging.org. I want to remind the funders on our call to be sure to register for the GIA annual conference coming up in Portland, Oregon on October 26th to 28th. More information is on our website. And finally, I want to thank all of you for participating in today's webinar on this important topic. Have a great day. <laughs>